Hi, everybody. It's Thursday. Uh, this is Mary Miller for SeaTac Environmental Association, and we do have our story time set up for today, as usual, and we will be continuing at least for a few more weeks. Um, Michelle on Tuesday, and I'll be doing Thursdays, and uh, there will also be a little, um, you know, some new things coming up on the 2.30 slot on other days during the week, so keep an eye out for that. Thanks for joining us. So uh, the book we have for today is about a bird that's one of my favorites. It's a great blue heron. And uh, I see them here on Long Island. We are, um, we're based, SeaTac is based in Islip, New York, on the south shore of Long Island. And it's a great place to see birds like the great blue heron. Uh, tall legs, water birds that have a very sharp beak that can spear its food. Uh, right in the water and you know very slow moving and I'd say it's the kind of bird that if you get get close They'll they'll take off pretty quickly. So you really have to be very Quiet and very slow when you're approaching if you'd like to get a good look. But they're very tall um, they can be uh, Kind of as tall as a person you know, like almost five feet tall. So uh, They're just beautiful and uh, wonderful to see them fly. They kind of bend their neck in when they're flying. And uh, you can see them, you know, the huge wings. And I'll, I'll show you some pictures so you can see. Um, maybe you have a favorite bird. I have another favorite bird, a red-winged blackbird, which is ex looks exactly like its name. It's a blackbird with red wings. And the wing has a, like a little tab of um, almost really orangey looking. And when it flies, you get that flash of color. It's just beautiful. And uh, that's a bird also that you see, uh, I don't see it in my backyard because I'm not close to the water, but when I get over to a marshy area on the North Shore, the South Shore of Long Island, I hear their call and um, love to see them fly. So let me uh, bring you over to our books for today and I'll uh, switch the camera around and I'll show you uh, some, some great blue herons and as well as some uh, birds that resemble great blue herons. Okay, here we go. So this is our book for today. It's uh, Sap Sucker Blues, and it's written by Anita Schmidt Kayanka. So you can see I love those uh, just tall birds as a family, and that's what the story is about, our family. And I just want to show you some pictures of, um, of similar birds. This is my uh, a great uh, natural history book. Smithsonian Natural History. It's just got wonderful pictures. Not, not a lot of detailed information about, uh, about animals and plants, but a lot of, you know, just beautiful pictures. And, um, you know, we'll take a look at a few over here. Like I said, it's a great, great blue heron is the bird that we're going to be reading about today, but there are many other kinds of herons. So we have like a yellow crowned night heron it's got a little yellow on the crown, meaning on the head. And we've got a tricolored heron. It's got that, that very tall, tall body. And then we have uh, egrets, which many maybe you've seen. And you can distinguish certain egrets by the color of their bill. This one, the great egret, has that yellow bill. And uh, see the, the color of the legs and specifically the color of the feet are all distinguishing f uh, features when you're trying to identify different birds. Um, well, here's a bird that we don't see here, but when I was in the Everglades, wow, the roseate spoonbill. And its bill is actually at the bottom is in the shape of like a spoon. Again, a very big bird and just like many of the birds in the Everglades, just so so colorful. So again, lots of birds that might resemble the great blue heron. And uh, you know, they see, people see egrets and other kinds of herons. And now I'll show you the picture of our, our uh, bird of the day. And that's the great blue heron. There he is, the great blue heron. So take a look at his legs, very long legs. And that beautiful blue color which again, in, in this case, the bird's name has its color 
in its name and you see the black by its eye and the and the long beak long beak okay so and then there's a picture of it flying see it looks very different it's got its neck pulled in so it looks very different but look at the feet um, behind him okay so now let's get started on our book okay first starts out um, with an, an introduction that introduces us. Here's one of the first beautiful drawings of the bird. Okay, and we'll go right over to <clears throat> our introduction to our friend, the great blue heron. So here he is, and it points out that he has a flexible neck, which we just saw in the flying picture where his neck can uh, get into a, an S shape, like the letter S, and f while he's flying, so he looks very different when he's flying, and his uh, plumage, which that's what we're describing as feathers, his plumage is a good camouflage. I bet you know what that means, where if he's in his environment, he, he blends in because he's a similar color to the water uh, around him. And here's something very special about the great blue heron. It's called the hallux, and it's a toe that's backwards facing. See on the back there? It's a backwards facing toe, and it helps him uh, hold on to branches and to be able to stand on very thin branches and be well balanced. And just a few more things we'll look at before we start the story is here's his beak and it's described here in the book as dagger-like, like like a, like a knife. And they use their large yellow beak to grab prey, that's the food, the animals that they're eating, and impale large fish. So it actually sticks right into the fish, impales the fish. And the yellow eyes, very distinctive feature, um, they have good night vision, uh, and their feathers are powdery down feathers. And it's used, it's funny, it says it's used like a napkin during preening to wipe slime off the beak, feet, and feathers. And here's another very uh, unique characteristic, and look at the joint right there, it's called a backward bending joint, which is like our ankle, right? Right there is the joint, the joint where, it, the joint is where there's a bend, like just like our elbows or our knees. And now, and the last thing it's pointing out here is the very long legs that allow it, because it, it walks out into water, so it's standing in the water and it's nice and high up while it's standing in the water looking for food, very, very still, very still. Okay, so let's get started with our story. And again, the name is Sap Sugger Blues. And um, yeah, blues, I, it's lots of times when we see the word blues, it sounds like something sad. But in this case, we're talking about the color of our animal. And hopefully there isn't a sad part of this story, but let's, let's find out. Okay, so first page. What does that look like to you? Looks like we have a nest. The story begins with a nest as big as your bed, a nest so deep that if it were a puddle and, you're, and you jumped in it, your knees would get wet. Sounds like puddle jumping at our little peepers forest school. A nest so high that if it were your school, you would have to climb up five flights of stairs to reach it. Maybe you've seen a great blue heron nest. That's what it looks like. Cable is laid through the woods underwater and high in the old oak tree. An arborist is a tree doctor. He climbs the tree and installs a microphone and two cameras. 
So many times you can look on the computer and you can uh, watch animals in their nest because they've put, just like this picture showing us, they've put a camera and a microphone in a tree or somewhere where a nest is so that you can watch it. And then a question here, the book, uh, our story asks is, would you like to have a job that involves climbing trees? Hmm. Okay, it is March and the male great blue heron returns from his winter home. He has come back to the same tree for three years. We recognize him because he is missing Hallux, the toe that faces backwards. He pulls up on a large branch and then snaps down. Finally, he breaks it, flies to the nest, and presents it to his mate. Fortunately, she accepts it. Here's Mama. Mama Heron lays the first egg. She stands up, checks it out, looks again, sits back down. There's the egg. Okay. Now what? Oh, what do you see there? Something else has happened. Mama Heron lays the second egg. She stands up, looks again, rolls the eggs, and sits back down. Okay, what do you think's next? Didn't you count them? One, two, three. Number three, she stands up, checks it out, looks again, rolls the eggs, picks up sticks, and six sits back down. And next, <laughs> I bet you were able to guess what was coming next. Unbelievable, she lays egg number four. How many eggs will Mama Heron lay? Make your guess now, let's find out. The last egg she lays is number five. People watching the webcam, that's the camera that they put up in the tree by the, by the nest, called this egg Fiverr just like the number five. It takes about 28 days for great blue heron eggs to hatch. Will Fiverr be the last to hatch? How do Mama and Papa Heron keep them warm? Especially when, uh-oh, look what happened. There's a record snowfall in April. So much snow has never fallen this late in the season. Snow piles up, gets deep, schools close, roads are too dangerous to travel. Think about how cold it must be. Where is Papa Heron? Oh, he's covered with snow. Later he stands up, shakes off the snow, and quickly lowers himself over the eggs again. So how does he keep the eggs warm even in a blizzard? Look closely. There it is. The soft red bald spot is known as a brood patch. In herons, both Mama and Papa Heron have one. It turns red as blood flows to it and it's very warm, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. How does that compare to your temperature? A human's temperature is about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, so this is warmer than our body temperature. Incubation means to add heat to the eggs. Incubation. Mama and Papa Heron take turns incubating the eggs. They also roll them. Scientists think they roll the eggs to evenly distribute the heat. Peepers call. Canada geese softly hunk down below. Nighttime comes to Sapsucker Pond. Uh-oh. What do we have here? Do you think this is a predator? Oh no, watch out. Silently, a great horned owl attacks Mama Heron in the darkness of the pre-dawn, before the dawn, before the sun comes up. Who will win this battle? Mama Heron puffs up her feathers like a pterodactyl. In distress, she screams and squawks. Then the owl silently lands on the branch, blinks its eyes, and finally flies away. Mama Heron's long black nuptial feather is lost in the battle. One egg looks damaged. Is it Fiverr? 
Was Fiverr's egg damaged? Oh, we hope not. One by one, the chicks begin to hatch. Each chick uses its egg tooth, that's a special bump on the chick's beak, to crack open the shell. It twists and punches until it is free. When first hatched, they are bedraggled, which is a good way to say they're wobbly and wet. Can you tell which chick just hatched? The one that's bedraggled, yeah, you can see. Here's the one that hatched first, and this one still looks a little wobbly and wet, kind of bedraggled. Do you ever look bedraggled <laughs> or you feel bedraggled? Four great blue heron chicks have hatched. Whoa, oh, look at those like, furry balls. It's, you can all even tell they're birds in this picture. So what about Fiverr? What about the last one? Yay, Fiverr has hatched. Yay. Eyes open. The oldest chick begins to look around. Okay, now do you see all the fur, furry feathers here? And let's see, where's that eye open? There it is. That eye is open. Probably the first one who, who hatched. He's not bedra as bedraggled as the others. Ooh, a little almost hard to tell what this is. Just so many feathers. So many feathers. Mama and Papa Heron take turns erping. That's regurgitating food for the chicks. That means the parents went to get food, put it in their body, and then spit it out for the babies. It's called erping. Fish is their main food, but when out hunting, herons will snatch anything in motion. Once, Mama Heron delivered a large floppy goldfish. The chicks seemed confused. Can you think of a time when you were confused? A goldfish is not indigenous. It's not naturally occurring to fish to Ithaca, New York. So I guess that's where this uh, cam was, where these birds live. And someone, I, I, I'm going to guess, well, what do you think? How did that goldfish get in the water? Did you ever hear of people like putting their pets in, in a pond somewhere, which they really shouldn't do. They shouldn't just dump animals into into a pond or a stream, but it looks like that's what happened. That's probably where that goldfish came from, and that was very confusing. All right, ooh, they're looking much more grown up now. Clacking and clamoring, the chicks mug Mama Heron for food. They squawk, they flap, feeding is a frenzy. Head first, they swallow whole, the slithering, often still living prey that is erped up from the stretchy throats and stomachs of their parents. Wow, so sometimes the parents eat like a little fish and it's still alive when they spit it back out for the babies. The chicks gulp fish faster than you can count. The chicks never did eat the meadow vole, sometimes called a meadow mouse. Mama Heron brought it for them. They tossed it back and forth, picked it up, dropped it. Apparently fuzzy wasn't appetizing. Have you ever eaten anything fuzzy? <laughs> I don't know about that. Okay, so what, what is this picture? Hmm, doesn't look like birds. What do we got? All that eating leads to a lot of pooping. They poop on the nest, they poop on the branches, they even poop on the camera, that camera that's up in the tree. Their poop is white and watery. If you found great blue heron poop on the sidewalk, it would be as big as a dinner plate. Remember, it's a very big bird. Five growing herons and two erping parents make a total of five babies and two parents. How many do we have? Yes, we have seven pooping herons. That's a lot of poop. And here's the picture, that nice picture from the cover. They look very grown up now, no little bedraggled babies anymore. And they have that, that halfox at the back, the toe that helps them hold on to the branch. Five great blue heron chicks are too big for the nest. They branch out, hop, flap, dance, lift off, run up and down, then jump back to the nest. Decisions are made. The branch dips and sways 
like a diving board. The chicks have grown too big for the camera. All the camera sees is their big feet. <laughs> the herons are well camouflaged. Sometimes it's hard to tell where the tree ends and the heron begins. So you know the word camouflage, right? How the animal's color helps it blend in with its surroundings where it lives. With a flap of its wings, lift off. The first brave heron fledges. It flies for the first time. Oh, and here's, I, I would imagine this is really like heaven for the great blue herons. Standing in the water, trees all around where their nests could be. Unbelievable, find them. Four great blue herons are exploring Sapsucker Pond, looking all grown up, waiting, silently stalking, snatching prey. But what about Fiverr? There are only four here. One, two, three, four. Oh, there she is at the end of the branch. What do you think she's thinking about? What do you think? Oh, that's what it actually says here. What <laughs> do you think? What could she be thinking? As she stands on the edge of the branch, is this her first time to fly? Uh-oh, she's not ready. She's heading back to the nest. Mama and Papa Heron still come to feed her. Her brothers and sisters come to visit at night. Not quite ready, but you think she'll get ready soon? Let's see. There, she's on the branch again, thinking about trying that new thing, trying to fly. She's taken her first flight and now is in a different tree. She looks down from her new perch and knows what she needs to do next. She did it. People around the world hugged and cried and cheered. Fiverr has fledged. And when they talk about people over the world, it's because anybody around the world could watch the camera that's on the tree where the eggs were laid. So literally people all over the world were so proud of Fiverr. But don't be sad. This is not the end of our great blue heron story. It's really just the beginning. Now it's up to you to go outside, explore and discover the natural world around you. Great blue herons can be found all over North America. That's our continent. And the United States is in North America. So great blue herons can be found all over the United States in fresh water and salt water. Remember to look up, you might see Fiverr flying overhead. And this last two pages, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over with you quickly because it has great information about our, uh, our great blue herons. They're big birds, of course, which we've said, and they can be almost as tall as your mom, five feet. If your dad held his arms out and you measured him from fingertip to fingertip, a heron's wingspan would be about the same length, about six feet. But a heron only weighs five or six pounds, about the same as a bag of flour. And I'm gonna bring over the great blue heron picture while I'm reading this so you can look at him. <clears throat> you can look at him while I'm speaking about the great blue heron. Now the behavior, they tuck their long necks into an S shape, flap their wings very slowly when they fly. They hunt slowly too, they stand very still, then suddenly dart their neck out super fast, stabbing their prey with their pointy bill. What will they eat? Well, you already know about some from our story. We know they'll eat fish, they'll eat frogs, snakes, turtles, rodents, like little mice, uh, bugs, birds, or pretty much anything they can grab or stab and swallow. Their slow movement and blue-gray plumage, remember that's their feathers, the plumage, make for good camouflage. That's why it's sometimes hard to tell where the tree ends and the heron begins. Herons have a powder on the long white feathers on their chest. 
They use the powder like a napkin to clean the slime off their beaks and feathers, where herons walk and what they eat tends to be slimy. Having a built-in napkin is handy. And about migration, so migration means that if it's too cold here, for example, and they can't, like say the water is frozen and they can't get food, they travel to a place that's warmer. So great blue herons, that's called migration, they migrate and they can be found year round in places where the water does not freeze, but they will migrate from places where the water freezes. The water freezes in Sapsucker Pond in the winter, so our family of, of herons migrates to a warmer place. And the last piece of information about our great bird here is they live in freshwater and saltwater habitats of North America. Excuse me. Some people have small ponds in their backyard that they stock with goldfish. Perhaps the adult heron had been fishing in someone's backyard pond swallowing a goldfish, then erped it up into the nest. Oh, so that was another way they could get the goldfish is from somebody not dropping it into a natural habitat, but the, the um, great blue heron actually went to someone's pond and grabbed it for their baby. Okay, so let's just check out. I think we just have one little finale page here all kinds of imaginings, like if you were a great blue heron, I'll just read uh, two of them. So imagine flying over places you've never seen before to get to a place you've never been. And imagine if your bed was on the top of your house and you had to sleep in the rain, the snow, the wind, or even a ferocious thunderstorm. And the picture of the author. She likes outdoor exploring. Okay, Sap Sucker Blues. That's the end of our story. And we hope we'll see you again at 2.30 on the SeaTuck website in future weeks. And again, our stories will continue at 2.30 on Tuesdays with Miss Michelle and Thursdays for at least the next couple of weeks. We hope to see you then. Be sure to get outside, keep your eyes open when you're in a near water, fresh or salt, for the great blue heron. And this is Mary Miller for SeaTuck Environmental Association. And we look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye.